revive us again. We'll start on the chorus. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Revive us again. Verse number one. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love. Turn over one to the left to six three, excuse me, to three six eight or three six nine, and we'll sing about one of the ways God brings revival to us, and that is by uh, letting us in on a secret about how the blood of Jesus Christ is able to cleanse us from all of our sins. All right. Let's sing out on this song together. What can wash away my sins? Yeah. 
Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let me hear on that chord. Sing it out now. I'll be here this evening. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Brian, and I am the pastor of Clearbrook, um, almost like your name, uh, Clearview, but ours is Clearbrook Baptist Church in Roanoke, Virginia. And I've been privileged to be the pastor there since June 2011. And I met Pastor Dustin at Bible College. We happen to be roommates, and um, I, I can't remember if we shared a bunk or not, but did we? <coughs> Don't remember? All right. Yeah. It's been so long ago, we can't remember. Yeah, we're getting old, man, I'm telling you. Uh, but anyways, we are so honored to be here with you guys this week. We drove up here on Sunday, and then Monday was our, our what we call our day of rest or our fun day, and we drove up to the ark, and we got to see the ark, and I know many of you have heard that story, but I'll just keep sharing it. And we had an awesome time. I didn't realize how big that boat was that Noah built back in the day, but it was large. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll introduce ourselves again, and our team, if you just want to share your name, and then um, how about, how, about um, how, many, how long you've been coming to Clearbrook, and maybe your favorite Bible verse if you have one. All right? Robbie, you want to start, brother? Uh, sure. Um, uh, I'm Robbie, and uh, I've been coming to Clearbrook for as long as he's been there, and um, I was just saying that. Okay. <laughs> so everybody can see you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> this is not my first time sharing. Um, so, uh, uh, my name is Robbie, and I've been going to Clearbrook as long as he is. And then my favorite Bible verse is probably, I don't know, like a lot of them, probably John, either John 3.16 or Romans 6.23. So. Hi, my name is Chloe, I've been going to Clearbrook about maybe two years, and um, Picking a favorite Bible verse is kind of hard, but um, maybe I would pick Luke 145. Amen. All right. With God, Josh, I've been going to Clearbrook for about nine years now. All right. Thanks, Josh. And I'm Rebecca. I've been going to Clearbrook a little over a year. And um, I guess I would say Jeremiah 2911. Amen. I'm Narasa. I've been going to Clearbrook for a year, and I think my favorite is Psalm 23. All right. Nice. I'm Jalen. I've been going to Clearbrook for about 11 years now. I don't, don't, I don't have a favorite All right. Okay. I'm Pepper. I've been going to Clearbrook for like four or five years now, and um, I agree with Chloe. Picking a favorite verse is really hard. Um, I'm going to go with Sacrament. Uh, Second Corinthians uh, 5-7, uh, walk by uh, faith and not by sight. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chris. I've been going for two to three years, and I really don't have a favorite verse to... All right, thanks, Chris. Yeah, Chris is back there helping us out with our media, and so we are recording these services um, on our cameras back there. We are doing that just so that our church family back home can be involved. Um, in some way, shape, or form when we get back home and upload these so they can see how the Lord was moving here. And um, so, yeah, so if you have any questions about that and would like to see the services, we'd be happy to send a link to Pastor Dustin. And, hey, I know that most of you were here last night, but in case you, you, you didn't know, back in 2015, I led a group of our church from Clearbrook across America on a bicycle, and I rode across America on a bicycle in 30 days. We rode 100 miles a day, 
and didn't die. Uh, so that's a miracle in of itself. But I also wrote a book about it. And we have some books. Uh, we have plenty more up here. Uh, but there's only a couple back there. But if you don't have a copy of this book, it is yours for free. So please be sure to grab one before you leave. And uh, hey, if you have friends or family that you'd like to get one, we brought 60 of these and we want to give them out. We want to give them away, all right? So please give them away to some of your friends and family that you might know in the area. All right? Um, any announcements you want to share to the church about your church? Okay. All right, well, we're looking forward to being here with you guys uh, all through the weekend. And if you want to take your hymnals and turn to number 365, 365, and if you're able to stand again, let's stand together as we sing this song, No, Not One. Three six five. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could hear. Alright, 
You ready? Yeah. All right. <laughs>
Bible study. And everybody else, we would invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ruth. Book of Ruth. Again, we want to say thank you um, to Sister Robin, Sister Sarah, and Sister Penny. Thank you, ladies, so much for fixing us the meal so far. They have been extra delicious. And it spilled my tummy up very good. Yes, so thank you. Especially that nice dessert you guys have been making. Ruth chapter 1 is where we're going to be this evening. If you don't have a Bible, would like to invite you to use one of the ones found in the pew there. And um, when you find your, your text there, the book of Ruth, I would invite you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. Pastor Dustin was telling me that you guys were studying the book of Judges, and the book of Ruth is right after the book of Judges. And we're just going to read um, the first five verses in Ruth chapter 1 this evening. So you can follow along as I read Ruth chapter 1, beginning with verse 1 and ending in verse 5. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Mahon and Kilion, Eph Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Mahlon and Kilion died also, both of them. And the women was left of her two sons. And her husbands. May God's blessings be upon the reading of His Word. Would you bow your hearts with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we come before you right now thanking you for your amazing grace, for your all sovereign hand in our lives. And we ask you right now, God, that you would open our eyes so that we may see wondrous things from your Word. We pray, God, that this evening we will see a glimpse of the holy, righteous, sovereign God on His throne. We thank You for this book in the Old Testament lodged between Judges and Samuel. Father, to, to remind us that even in the darkest days of Israel's past, You always have a plan, and You always shine Your light of truth in the midst of darkness. And so now, God, we ask right now that You would empower me with Your Holy Spirit, that You will take me, Use me as your vessel to your people tonight. Right. In Jesus' mighty name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing to honor the reading of God's words. You may be seated. The first verse of Ruth reminds us of the setting in which Ruth and Naomi and Orpah lived. And it says it was in the time period of the Judges. And as you studied last year, how the book of Judges is like a cycle. How the people of Israel were seeking God, then they would stray from seeking God and start worshiping other gods. And then as a result, God would raise up other people groups to come in and oppress them. And then the Israelites would cry out to God and say, God, please help us. And God would raise up a deliverer like Gideon, a deliverer like Samson, a deliverer like Deborah, and many of the others. And God would use those individuals to oversee them and to deliver them from their enemies. And then there would be peace in the land, and then Israel would go back to worshiping other gods. And the cycle continued and continued. But the interesting thing is, is when you read the book of Judges, from chapter 1 all the way to the end, it's like this cycle, it, it's a cycle, but it continues to go downward and downward and worse and worse and worse. And so each judge, as they progress through the narrative, the judge is just worse morally and worse morally and worse morally. And so as we read the book of Judges, what we see is that this was the darkest period of Israel's past. But God shines His light of truth behind the shadows of life. Tonight, as, as we think about the book of Ruth, 
There's one word that comes to my mind. Redemption. Would you say that with me? Redemption. Redemption. Say it again. Redemption. Redemption. And one more time. Redemption. Redemption. This word summarizes all four chapters, the entire narrative, where Elimelech and his family moves to Moab, then Elimelech dies, his two sons dies, leaving three widows, and one of them, Orpah, stays, goes back to her hometown, her home with her father, and then Ruth and Naomi travel back to Bethlehem, and they so happen to meet Boaz and his field, and they're reaping from the harvest there, and then God raises up Boaz to marry Ruth and go involved with her and to redeem her in what is called a leveret marriage. And I'll explain what that is later on. But then in chapter 4, we see how, how they get married and they have a child and God preserves the lineage of the Messiah. And so this book of the Bible, it's amazing because it seems to me that in every period of Old Testament history and even up until the times of Christ, Satan was at work trying to dilute the human race to such a degree that the Messiah would not be born. But it is in this passage that God raises up a Jewish man and a Gentile woman to preserve the lineage of the Messiah. And the promise of Genesis where the Bible says that the Messiah would crush the Satan and the enemy. So this evening, the title of my message is simply The Power of Redemption. What we are going to see tonight as we walk through this narrative together is there is much power in God's plan of redemption. There is power in redemption. And as I've been meditating in the book of Ruth, really for, for, for many years now, but, but just recently for preparing for tonight, I, I, I want to share this with you. If you leave with anything, this is the thought I want you to leave with tonight. This is the sermon in a nutshell. God is at work in the shadows of life, redeeming his people from sin. God is at work in the shadows of life, redeeming his people from sin. I don't know in the 1990s whether you might have saw the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies or not. I think you've heard of them. You've heard of Raphael and Donatello and Michelangelo and Leonardo. You've heard of them, right? You've seen the, the movies, maybe? Well, if you understand anything about those teenage mutant ninja turtles, is that they lived in the sewer system. They lived down in the shadows, away from everybody, and they did not come out during the day, did they, Josh? They came out during the night because they wanted to remi- remain hidden and unseen. And so it's interesting, as you read the story of Ruth, and read this love story between Ruth and Boaz, what you'll realize is God in this passage is a whole lot like those teenage mutant ninja turtles in that fantasy world in a movie we see. How that those mutant ninja turtles were in the shadows of life seeking to overcome the evil villains. God is in behind the scenes in Ruth chapter 1, in Ruth chapter 2, in chapter 3 and 4, in behind the shadows orchestrating things out to redeem his people from sin. Uh, and this yeah. book is so amazing because it reminds us that even in the darkest days of history, God is still at work and God can redeem those who have been smitten by sin. Well, what does this book teach us about God's power of redemption, you might be asking? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I want to walk us through a couple scenes here. Before we do, let's, let's consider this. In Ruth chapter 1, we read a story of grief. A woman, three women in fact, have gone through losing their husbands. And that is a hard thing to go through. No matter if you've lost a son or a daughter or a cousin or a neighbor or a friend. Grief is hard. And what we see in Ruth chapter 1 is Naomi is a very bitter woman. She is... When she returns to Bethlehem, she says, Call me not Naomi, in verse number 20, call me Mara or Mara. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. In this particular moment of Naomi's life, she was at the lowest of lows. And she was a widow. In the ancient world, in the time in which this book was written, we understand that widows were, were often some of the weakest members of society. 
Oftentimes in this culture, women did not work out in the, in the workforce. They were keepers at home in this particular time. And so if the woman at home was married and lost her husband, that would mean that she would lose perhaps the ability to pay the bills and perhaps forfeit the home in which she lived. And then she didn't have the resources and the finances to go out and to buy the field in the market or the, the, the food in the marketplace. And so in this particular chapter, we see that they are traveling back to go live with their relatives in Bethlehem so that they can be taken care of. In chapter 2, Ruth is encouraged by Naomi to go to a field. Now, if you remember anything about Old Testament history, imagine this is a field. And in, in the, middle, uh, the middle is a, a big garden. But what would happen is they would harvest the produce and they would take some of the produce and they would put it on the sides of the field for those who were poor. And they would allow the poor. Oftentimes, the widows would be the ones involved in going to the sides of the field to pick from the harvest so that they could glean and eat at home. And there, Ruth is going to this field, and it just so happens that she goes and stumbles across Boaz's field, who is actually her, her relative. And in this particular chapter, he sees her and finds favor. They engage in a conversation for the very first time, and it's very beautiful. And in chapter 3, Naomi invites her and says, Go see Boaz, because he's your closest kin, and he can redeem you. And so she gets dressed, and she puts on her nicest clothes, and goes to where Boaz is in the threshing floor. That was like a place, an area where they would harvest the different grains and other types of produce in the ancient world. And there he was at night, and there she comes and, and lays down before him and says, Will you redeem me? Now, in our mind, we think, what? What do, you, what do you mean, redeem, Ruth? What? What's going on here? Well, an ancient custom back in the days of the Old Testament was this concept of a leveret marriage. Now, maybe you've heard of this before, maybe you haven't, but I'm going to explain it to you. A leveret marriage, it's a big fancy word that simply means in the Old Testament time period, God devised this plan so that when the people of Israel would go through a horrible time, like a, a wife losing her husband, she would be involved in being redeemed into what is called a leveret marriage. And so the closest of kin to her husband would take her in and she would become his wife. And then the property that they own, he would buy it and redeem it. And so in this particular case, she is going to Boaz, asking Boaz,